want to thank everybody for coming to a night I've looked forward to, and I bet you have too. I want to start with a, um, by observing that this is a, a typically fascinating day at Purdue, the fa just the afternoon. I, I've just come from a presentation sponsored by uh, a major uh, company of, let's call it the traditional economy, Rolls-Royce, an annual lecture here, and, uh, and now uh, here to, uh, to uh, meet with, along with you, a leader of the front edge of the newest economy. This posed a problem for me, which is, you know, what do I wear today? And uh, I told Paul, don't let it go to your head. This wasn't for you. <laughs> this was for the last event, which, uh, uh, at which the speaker was, uh, coincidentally, uh, General um, Maziello, who runs the $4 billion a year Air Force Research uh, Organization. And uh, he has cruise missiles and you don't, so I dress for him. That's the... <laughs> but um, seriously, th there was a, there's, our, our, our guest tonight represents an intriguing bridge between those two worlds, just coincidentally. Both are, have re he worked at DARPA, I, I'm guessing this audience knows a lot about it, if not we can talk about it. And of course the Air Force is a principal a partner and, and customer of DARPA as well. So um, we are thrilled to have with us Paul Aramanko, um, one of the leading innovators in the most innovative business arguably uh, that we have. Um, we can claim him partially, we claim some patrimony because he grew up in West Lafayette. And uh, uh, from there to MIT and Caltech and a, and a bizarre trip through Georgetown Law School. As far, until tonight, I, I didn't know anyone who ever went there came to anything. Well, <laughs> I did, that's what that's about. Um, so let's, uh, we're gonna, I'm gonna uh, try to draw Paul out on a few questions and then we want the, most of the hour to be uh, led by your questions, so please be formulating them. But let's get started. I, uh, Paul's very self-effacing and wouldn't do this on his own, but I'm going to insist that he talk just for a minute or two about his own career. And I'll ask you, having done that, uh, you're a visionary, look forward, what would you like the rest of your career to look like? So past and future, please. Sure, absolutely. Um, well, first of all, thank you. Uh, thank you very much, President Daniels, for having me here. Um, thank you all for coming and uh, for taking the time. Um, I hope to make this, uh, that we can make this, uh, this interesting and worth, worthwhile for you. Um, uh, this, by the way, is, represents Google formal attire, uh, just so you know. This is like Google black tie. <laughs> Otherwise, it would be a hoodie. Um, so, but um, uh, to answer your question, uh, uh, both simultaneously sort of going back in time uh, and going forward in time, because there is a certain circularity and symmetry to most of our lives, right? Uh, I, uh, I want to build a starship. Mm -hmm. I've always wanted to build a starship. Um, and uh, I, for sort of as long as I can remember, after I stopped wanting to be a bunny rabbit, I wanted to build a starship. And uh, uh, I grew up, uh, as, as President Daniels mentioned, in, in West Lafayette. I went to West Lafayette High School. Um, both of my parents are uh, in the audience and both are at Purdue. Um, and quite early in my high school career, I, uh, I started taking flight lessons because that was the closest I could get to a starship at the time. Mm -hmm. And I trained at Eretz Airport, for those of you who remember it. Uh, sadly, the field, uh, it was in Lafayette, and sadly, the field closed a few years ago. Uh, Purdue Flying Club used to be there, moved over to the field, uh, field here in, uh, in West Lafayette. Um, and, uh, and then after, uh, uh, you know, after, uh, after getting my pilot's license and graduating high school, um, I would have loved to stay here at the wonderful aeronautics school that there is at Purdue. But as I said, both of my parents were on campus. So, <laughs> so, so I fled. <laughs> um, and uh, and after after uh, getting my undergraduate and masters, I built uh, I built UAVs, mm -hmm. what are I think somewhat uncharitably and a little bit unfairly are commonly known as drones. Um, and so I was a uh, I was an aerospace engineer. I was a UAV designer for uh, for some years. Uh, did a stint management uh, management consulting. Um, and over that uh, sort of that trajectory, I got really. Uh, interested, so I never lost sight of the goal of ultimately wanting to build a starship. And and one thing that really struck me, um, for those of you who've ever ever seen this, uh, Norm Augustine, a former CEO of Lockheed Martin, is very fond of plotting the cost of airplanes. Mm -hmm. 
um, over time, going back to the Wright brothers, um, and he plots it on a logarithmic scale, so it's an exponential curve. And uh, if you look at it, it's, it's been growing exponentially, and if you project it forward in the year 2054, the entire U.S. defense budget buys one airplane, right? Mm -hmm. And the, the Malthusian fallacy sort of notwithstanding, uh, it appears that we're tracking that trend line and have been for some time. And, uh, and so my view was, if I'm going to build a starship, you know, it's going to be like year 2054, and if an airplane is going to take up the entire uh, U.S. defense budget, what's a starship going to cost? And so what I got really interested in is uh, the limits uh, of complexity that we as a species are capable of grappling with in engineering systems. And I think that a lot of the big defense systems, a lot of the uh, aerospace and defense systems, are pushing that, uh, that edge of what's feasible, what we as a society are capable of managing. Um, and I think that's a lot of why that escalation has taken place. And so, so one, of my, the, one of my passions in animating things uh, throughout my career to date, and I suspect going forward, has been what are the ways of tackling complexity? Um, the, uh, and that complexity transcends just, I mean, my particular interest is in sort of going to the nearest star, but, uh, but that complexity is all around us. It's in cities, it's in the energy grid, um, it's in the internet, frankly. Um, uh, so that, uh, that's really been my interest. Uh, and then after, after spending some time at DARPA, for those of you who know DARPA, it's a tenure limited organization. That's one of the ways of sort of applying pressure mm -hmm. uh, to the innovation process. Um, ATAP, which is the group at Google uh, that, I, that I sit in, the Advanced Technologies and Projects group, is meant to be uh, an attempt to replicate some of the DARPA DNA and the DARPA innovation model in the private sector. And so it is also a tenure limited organization. Um, so I know my expiration date, um, and uh, it creates very interesting sort of psychological incentives. Um, and frankly, I don't know what I'll, I'll do after that, but the, the ultimate goal is to build a starship. Yeah. <laughs> well, the overlap between your presentation and, and uh, General Marciello's is, is even bigger than I thought. There I, you go. I, I, he probably wishes he would have been here to, he's, to hear that. He's grappling with those curves that you're talking That's about. Exactly right. That's exactly right. Well, let's, let's uh, 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 our, our guest is not just a practitioner, but if, if you read about him, a, a, a thoughtful and insightful theoretician about innovation. So let's just spend a little bit of time on that. Uh, are innovators, uh, great innovators, born or can they be made? Can it be taught, as some universities uh, hope they can? Uh, can it be nurtured if they get the environment right? Can people become more uh, it, uh, imaginative and creative than they might otherwise be, or is it Pretty much a yeah, gift. It, it's an interesting question, right? And 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 I don't have I, I don't have an empirical answer to it, mm -hmm. um, but I have uh, uh, I sort of have my own theory that's at least anecdotally supported, um, and I tend to subscribe to um, a, sort of to paraphrase Richard Feynman, um, uh, the great physicist. Uh, I think he said that everything he ever he sort of stopped learning new things right around grad school, um, and it's been always applying the tool set that he has learned mm -hmm. to new domains and to new sets of problems. Um, that's probably gross, go, gross paraphrasing of what he actually said. Um, and, and so I do think that uh, a lot of innovation is taking a set of tools that we know the, and sort of patterns of how we know to solve various problems and applying them in new territories. Um, now, You're not saying that an aerospace engineer can build a cell phone, are you? <laughs> well, so you would be surprised, right? Yeah. So a lot of the genesis of the ARA project actually comes from a satellite program mm -hmm. uh, and a manufacturing program, a design tools and manufacturing tools program that, that I ran at DARPA. Um, uh, and I, I joke uh, to Regina, my boss, mm -hmm. who, also my boss at DARPA, that I'm a one-trick pony and she just needs to milk me for all the different tricks <laughs> that I can, I can do in different domains. Um, but, but in all seriousness, I do think... Um, uh, uh, that, that, that the tools uh, that, that we're all equipped with. Now, so those tools may have some, obviously, uh, uh, you know, you might have some biological genetic predisposition yeah. towards having a richer tool set than, some, than somebody else. Um, but uh, I think that most of innovation really is the ability to force yourself out of your domain of comfort and apply those tools somewhere mm -hmm. new. So for those who haven't had a chance to read about the DARPA way, or mm -hmm. however you term it, it now, the DARPA, now the Google ATAP mode, say That's a little right. bit about the, that approach to research and innovation. Yeah, so, uh, so just a real quick summary for, the, for, uh, uh, for those of you. I was giving a talk in, in, a, in a class earlier, and I was going on about the DARPA model of innovation, and then at the end, uh, the very first question was, what's DARPA? So I yeah, think yeah, I, should, yeah. <laughs> I should just make sure that everybody's <laughs> on the same page. So uh, DARPA is the Defense Advanced Research Projects Agency. Uh, created by President Eisenhower uh, in the wake of the Soviet launch of Sputnik. 
Um, and the purpose, the charter of the agency was the creation and prevention of strategic surprise. So quite explicitly, uh, uh, by that charter, it is not a requirements-based organization. Um, so the ideas are supposed to be, so it's, a, it's an inspiration-driven organization, if you will. Um, and uh, it has a couple of attributes, and, and uh, uh, ATAP is our way of trying to replicate that DNA uh, in the private sector. And, and actually, there have been a lot of attempts to sort of duplicate the DARPA DNA, and I would say that they've been met with mixed success at best. Mm -hmm. Um, and, uh, and so one of the things that I would credit uh, Regina, who was President Obama's, Regina Dugan, who was President Obama's first appointee uh, as DARPA director from, uh, in 2009, uh, was trying to distill that DNA to a, a, core, a core set of ideas. Um, so, so first and foremost uh, is the P in DARPA and the P in ATAP, and that's projects. Um, and uh, projects uh, is a very special term of art for us. It means that we operate at the intersection of uh, a compelling use case with fundamental scientific or technological insight. Um, and I think one or the other by Pasteur's itself. Pasteur's quadrant, right? Pasteur's quadrant, yeah. that's exactly right. Uh, that's a term that uh, Don, Donald Stokes, I believe, uh, coined. Um, and it is in contrast to Bohr's quadrant, which is uh, a sort of pure fundamental research and Edison's quadrant, which is more uh, applied, tinkering, yeah. right, in essence. Um, and so Pasteur's quadrant requires, requires both. Um, and there is an observation, which I think is, is empirically borne out, uh, if you lo look historically sort of down back to the primitive era of, of innovation, when we were inventing sort of stone tools, uh, all the way through the, uh, the Manhattan Project and, and, and Apollo, uh, where uh, use-inspired uh, research, use-inspired basic research, produced uh, uh, some really exciting, exciting results. Um, and I think, uh, I think a lot of uh, the, the, the fundamental innovation model, both in the government and in industry and in academia, I think uh, over the course of the 20th century has drifted away from that, actually. Mm -hmm. um, and, and, and we think that it's, it's helpful to all of those entities to, bring it, to try and bring it back to that. So that's, that's one aspect, is the project focus. Uh, second aspect is um, trying to overcome our uh, predilection, or I think innate, uh, I suspect, predilection uh, toward, uh, towards risk being risk averse. Um, and getting people to take risks is not just a matter of telling them, you know, be more risk, uh, risk tolerant. Mm -hmm. um, you actually have to create incentives that appeal to them at a more, at a more fundamental level. And, uh, and so uh, uh, we have two, two examples of those. Uh, one is, uh, is applying time, time pressure to projects. Mm -hmm. And in some cases, that's an, an intrinsic time pressure. So at DARPA, for instance, there's frequently a, war, a critical warfighter need, unfilled need, uh, and people are dying or being injured, right? And there's nothing quite like that to drive uh, urgency and the ability to take risk. Um, in the commercial sector, uh, some of those timelines are, are perhaps more artificial, but, but if you create a, a specific timeline and you stick to it, right, you have to have sort of persistence of principle. <laughs> Um, uh, then it creates, uh, it, it sort of puts uh, getting things done over making sure that you dot all the I's and cross all mm -hmm. the T's. And in large bureaucratic organizations, as, as, as they tend to be, uh, that's very important, is to, to get people to prize that. Now, the second thing we do is we limit people's tenure. Um, so uh, at DARPA, it's typically two to four years. At ATAP right now, it's fixed at two years. Um, and uh, that uh, sounds a little draconian. Not two years on a project, but two years in the, two years in in the, organization. the organization. That's right, mm -hmm. that's right. Um, and uh, it sounds a little draconian, but the reason is because we don't want people to make a career out of it. Because as soon as you know, they start thinking about sort of what's, what's going to happen 10 years from now, and am I going to get good peer reviews, et cetera, mm -hmm. uh, they don't want to take organization bureaucratic risks, or organizational risks. They don't push as hard. They try to play right. nice. And we try to incentivize people not to play nice, but to get stuff done, quite yeah. frankly. Um, and those can be, <laughs> can be intention. Yeah. We're all lovely people, I assure you. Um, but uh, uh, but when, when the two are intention, uh, we want people to do that. And then the third aspect is uh, uh, open innovation. Uh -huh. uh, and particularly at DARPA, right, that's a non-trivial thing. Uh, there's a tendency to, in the government to classify things, uh, uh, particularly in aerospace and... Uh, and critical military system domain, and I'm not disputing the importance of keeping some crown jewels close, uh, close to the chest uh, in any way, and similarly, similarly in industry. Um, but, uh, but our belief is that open innovation, both in terms of the partner ecosystem that we mm -hmm. access for innovation, um, and in terms of actually making the product known, uh, make, ultimately make for better products. They create some commercial risk, 
or some competitive risk in the case of defense systems. Mm -hmm. um, but, uh, but ultimately, that risk trade-off is worth it. Um, and so, for instance, on Project Ara, which is uh, you know, a fairly, fairly significant undertaking uh, for ATAP, uh, there are five of us who are at Google on the, on the Google payroll. Mm -hmm. uh, that includes me. Uh, and there is some three, four, five hundred people outside in the partner right. ecosystem. It includes a team at Purdue. Uh, it includes teams in industry and in startups and uh, nonprofits sort of all over the place. Um, and that lets us capture best in class, best in the world mindshare, people I could never convince to sort of pack up and move to Mountain View. Yeah. Now, it's a fascinating model, road tested at DARPA, and it's, it's interesting that it, businesses have been so, have had such difficulty either noticing or emulating it, but um, I, I, did, I did enjoy, when most of us think of Google or have visited Google, you think of this wide open, anything goes uh, in, environment. I did enjoy reading somewhere where either you or one of your colleagues were, were glad to move, you moved ATAP away, you didn't want to be stifled by the Google bureaucracy, which... Uh, <laughs> is not the way most of us think of that company. But. Um, Google is a unique place. Uh, and, and one thing that Google has done, right, so uh, the draconian measures about time pressure and, and sort of kicking people out after a couple of years, apart, Google has, uh, more so than any other place that I've worked, organically created a culture that I think is more accepting, much more accepting of innovation than, yeah. than others. Uh, but it is, it is uh, fundamentally different, and uh, Google is a software company for the most part. Uh, uh, ATAP is a hardware, is a mobile hardware organization for the most part, um, and uh, we are trying to do sort of a, a fairly controlled experiment. So I think that uh, uh, that level of autonomy has been helpful um, uh, yeah. to us, rather than being assimilated into into the broader culture. So let's hear about Aura. Um, the um, I, I asked you before we came out: is it is it a, a reasonably accurate usage to think of this as the democratization of Hardware, uh, much as, uh, as as many have uh, opened the world of software to um, the, the world of those who are interested, is this something like the same animating? I think that's an excellent uh -huh. analogy that yeah. holds uh, sort of not 100% because hardware in the end is a little bit different than software. Yep. Um, but uh, we're basically trying to create uh, the equivalent of an Android type ecosystem, but for hardware. Mm -hmm. And so Android has been sort of phenomenally successful in, uh, in taking software development, which was the, the province of you know, a, a good number of competitors. Uh, but still multiplying that by several orders of magnitude in app development, right? Creating an app is, is almost trivial uh, today. So ed anybody can do it. Anybody can go home and, and write an Android app, publish it to the Play Store, uh, and it could very well catch on, right? Mm -hmm. So it's kind of a pure meritocracy, highly competitive, and the innovation timescales are extraordinary, extraordinarily short. Right. Uh, and so we wanted to see if that was doable in hardware. Um, and so, uh, so uh, by following sort of the Android model, we are creating a free and open platform. So as Android is open source and, and freely available to anybody, uh, the Aura uh, developers kit, the, what we call the MDK, uh, is free and open and available to anybody. And so anybody can create a module per the specifications of the developers kit and uh, put it in the, in the Aura module marketplace, uh, which is analogous to the, to the Google Play Store. Um, and, and sell directly to consumers and see if, if their module is interesting, if it flies. Um, and, uh, and also we're trying to create a new generation of design tools, something that I started at DARPA, that makes the design of hardware much more like the software design experience. It raises the level of abstraction on the design process. Um, and so we're hoping to shrink uh, the ability to introduce new technology into the smartphone domain uh, uh, by uh, factor of five. That's our, mm. that's, our, that's our objective. So today it takes maybe 12, 18, 24 months to make a new, a new smartphone and bring it to market. Um, and we're hoping to get that down to a couple months, so on, on an app type, type, type time, time scale. Um, so that's kind of the developer facing goal of the project. Uh, there's also a consumer facing goal right. of the project. In any platform, right, there's the two sides and we play, right. we play as the arbiter or the facilitator of this two sided market. Uh, and so the user-facing goal for us is uh, to be able to create a platform that allows people to customize the device, uh, both functionally in terms of what modules uh, you wish, and also aesthetically. Uh, and that's not just a matter of sort of selecting the color of the device, but actually being able to tell some sort of story uh, through, through the device. My, my goal, uh, I like to say, is, is that you put your RF phone down on the table at dinner, and it becomes the topic of conversation for the first 10 or 15 minutes. So we wanted to tell your story to, to, for it to actually be expressive. 
Um, and uh, and w we believe that that level of flexibility for consumers to customize the device, uh, and, and if we can span uh, price points uh, that range from sort of a feature phone crossover price point all the way to an aspirational, very high-end device that may be able to do medical diagnostics, portable medical uh -huh. diagnostics, um, that that could potentially uh, help us on the way of delivering the mobile internet to the next five billion people who are not currently smartphone enabled. And we often forget that uh, uh, yeah. living in the developed world. So those are, those are the two goals. Um, I have some pictures of, of sort of where we stand. Sure. Um, so if you don't mind, I'll, I'll show those. Um, so this is uh, two, two, different sizes, uh, two different sizes of the frame. Uh, on the right is our medium variant. On the left is a mini. There's also a jumbo um, that's, uh, uh, that's uh, two-thirds wider uh, than, uh, than the medium. Uh, you see, so this is the back of the device, obviously. There are three types of modules. There is a, a one by one, which is the little square one. There's a one by two, uh, which is uh, twice the size of a one by one. Uh, there's the, the larger two by two modules, and, and those are interchangeable between, uh, the first two are interchangeable between the, the, the two variants there. Uh, the front of the device is, is, also, is also modular, so you can replace the display, you can upgrade it, uh, or if it breaks, uh, it becomes a relatively low cost component. Um, uh, to be able to, uh, to replace. Um, here's uh, our first functional prototype, uh, which uh, uh, with a module disassembled. Um, and so you see, uh, you see the module base populated by whatever the module developer creates. There's a shield on top of that that makes all modules look the same from an RF, from a radio frequency emissions perspective. An antenna, if this is a Wi-Fi module, um, so there's an antenna, and a shell. And the shell is consumer removable. So, uh, so you can put a picture of your cat on the shell, and then if your cat dies, you can get a picture <laughs> of a new cat on, on the shell um, and, uh, and, and, and swap it out. A um, uh, couple of interesting technologies here. So, and in fact, maybe before, before I get to that, I should say one thing about the, the, in, the industrial design. And this was, by the way, the biggest change for me going from, from developing airplanes and, and spacecraft and, and robots to, to cell phones. Uh, is airplanes are kind of e either, e either we care less, we have a less intimate relationship with airplanes, yeah. which is probably true, or maybe they're just inherently beautiful, um, but you kind of don't have to worry about the industrial design or the, uh, the appearance, the, the outward appearance too much. Um, here, industrial design is a really big deal, and modularity has negative connotations for most people. They think Legos, they think blocky, they think brick-like. Um, and, and so we sought design inspiration for this from uh, a variety of different sources, and, uh, and actually, this, uh, the, the, the key inspiration, the key moment of inspiration, which I, unfortunately I can't take 100% credit for, uh, John Maida from the Rhode Island School of Design uh, uh, gets some credit for it, was the Japanese bento box, um, which is, if you, th if you think about it, <laughs> is something that brings together uh, a, a very disparate dishes that usually look very different, and in fact, they, they try to make them as colorful and, and interesting as possible. Very different tastes, um, so those are kind of analogs to aesthetic and functional. Uh, uh, customization for us and brings it into a coherent meal uh, for people and, and lets them enjoy uh, these very different things as, as one whole. So it, it kind of navigates the contrast uh, between bringing together a bunch of separate pieces uh, but also giving the consumer a holistic experience. Um, so it was that as well as my sort of penchant for Art Deco aesthetics uh, uh. Uh, that, uh, that led to the industrial design. But one of the things we wanted to do is we wanted to make the, the module smooth pebbles. Um, so that there are, uh, to try and overcome this notion of, of boxiness and Lego, Lego-like uh, appearance. And so, uh, so we use magnets to attach the modules. They're called electro-permanent magnets. That's a picture of one uh, right there, uh, which is a unique type of magnet that can, you can turn on and off, but it doesn't consume power in either, either of those states. Uh, and the other, thing, uh, the other thing that we did that you can't see very well, uh, you can't see very well there, but use uh, inductive coupling. Uh, for the data transfer. So there's no connector, there's, no, there are no, uh, uh, there's nothing sticking out of the module. Um, and, uh, uh, and I don't know, uh, so this is a sort of a close-up of a module. You can see the two magnets, um, and you can see the, 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 data transfer, uh, uh, the data transfer pads there. Um, uh, so that's, uh, that was the sort of the industrial well, I wanted to ask journey. you a consumer-related yeah, yeah, question. Um, well, Henry, Henry Ford famously said, if I'd asked the consumer what he wanted, I'd have built a faster horse. And, uh, and, and, this, and th there have been many parallels, uh, if I'm permitted to mention his name, that guy at Apple, uh, Steve Jobs, uh, yep. was, uh, I don't know if disdainful is the right word, but 
certainly didn't rate market research very highly. He, he held, I think, to the view, as I understood it, that uh, uh, really it, it, it's the job of people like you to imagine new products or, and services that uh, people on their own wouldn't know, that they uh, wouldn't, wouldn't think to uh, request, demand, or desire. Uh, which, is, which is the aura? Did, did you, was, was there some sense that the world was waiting for this, or did, uh, is this more uh, intuitive? So I, I, I do think that it, it seems to tap into some unmet desire among, mm -hmm. among smartphone users. Uh, at least that's the response that we've seen in the, in the Twitter sphere, blogosphere, uh, mm -hmm. social media, and, uh, and in, in various venues. Um, uh, and I think that's because the industry seems to have converged towards a dominant design. Uh, and uh, frankly, at least my view is that, that successive cell phones from whatever manufacturer are rather boring because they all look the same. And it's a labor arbitrage play and mm -hmm. number of megapixels. And that's, that's about it. Uh, so I don't hold my breath for, for a new cell phone release. And I think, I think people share that, and so there is some angst for something new. Um, uh, that said, I, I do share uh, Mr. Jobs' uh, um, view that it's very for a category-defying device, it's very difficult to design it based on poll polling data. Mm -hmm. um, and so I think that there's been this big trend over the last several decades towards uh, uh, design for empathy or human-centric design. Uh, and I think that there is some merit to that, but I think it's better at doing incremental advances than it is at category-defying um, kinds of devices. So we're pleased to see very positive consumer sentiment uh, after the fact, <laughs> yeah. uh, but it was not designed based on, yeah. uh, on research data. So I'm going to invite the audience to, anybody, uh, to make their way toward the, I think there are two, um, mics and... Um, uh, in, in hopes I've just incited somebody to do that. Just a couple other quick questions. Uh, you talked about um, in, in, uh, uh, the, the virtues, maybe, of working under pressure, DARPA and model and all that. Uh, I, I love to quote I, I read somewhere that you said that, that, that innovation under extreme time pressure is generally of higher quality, which I guess is that point. Mm -hmm. Are you going to make the uh, you, deadline of early next year for this one? <laughs> So, uh, so I do want to set, set the record straight. One of the things about running a very open project is that there is a lot of, uh, there's a lot of crosstalk in, in, the, in the social media and the tech blogs, and not everybody hires fact checkers. <laughs> um, so, uh, so, the, uh, so the actual fact on, on, on this point is that we are, we are planning to do a market pilot in, in, in the course of 2015. Yep. Um, and uh, we don't have a general market release date. There's a lot more that we need to do in terms of retiring technical risks on the project. Um, we have probably two more iterations of uh, spi spirals, as we call them, of prototypes to make. Um, and then during the market pilot, we have a lot to learn about how people interact with this device. Um, we have a hypothesis, for instance, that a whole set of secondary markets will emerge, and by which I mean uh, the idea of used, selling used modules, sharing modules oh. with friends, swapping modules, uh, maybe having one module for, of a given type per family or per group uh, mm -hmm. of folks. And we're very interested in understanding all of those dynamics uh, first before we, uh, we, we take a step to unveil something like this globally. Well, it's one release I will be breathless to, uh, oh, to see you. come out. So, uh, well, let's start over here. We'll alternate sides. Hello. Mr. Aramenko, um, at the beginning of your talk, you mentioned uh, your interest in building a spaceship. And um, that, this is something that uh, Elon Musk is also investigating. Um, he's right now looking into ways to recycle rockets, make them cheaper for space exploration. Um, he gave a talk last year where he made uh, kind of an audacious claim that within 15 or 20 years, we might expect to see a human on Mars. And uh, I was ho wondering uh, what, what your thoughts on that timeline were, whether you think that's uh, realistic or outrageous, or if you know of any progress being made that direction. Yeah, I mean, I, uh, I think that, uh, uh, I think there's a two-part answer to that. I think there is the technology question of, do we have the technology necessary to get there, to sustain a human, and to either bring them back or to credibly colonize uh, uh, the planet? And I, I actually think most of the tech is there. Um, there's obviously some, uh, uh, there's uh, devils in the details and, and, and an even bigger devil is in the integration problem of a very large complex system. <laughs> um, and, uh, but I think, that's all, I think that's tractable and it's tractable probably on a timeline that's much shorter than the one you, cite, uh, the one you cited there. I do think there is a question of willpower 
uh, and commitment. And I think that one of the uh, one of the challenges uh, uh, that we have, and and actually maybe not to put you on the spot, but maybe President Daniels would comment on it, uh, given his experience in government, is uh, sort of the vagaries of the fiscal cycle. Um, is uh, you know one of the uh, uh, one of the aspects of democracy is the fact that administrations change, is uh, Congresses change, and priorities as a consequence change. Um, and so uh, NASA, which uh, ostensibly is our uh, our societies, or at least uh, America's societies, uh, sort of answer to the challenge of getting to Mars, uh, has a tendency to to sort of redirect uh, rather rather wildly over time. Uh, and there does need to be a sustained commitment on the, the uh, sort of order of magnitude of a decade or so. Mm -hmm. Um, to be able to do that. And so I think that's the bigger challenge. Uh, I do think that the advent of the new uh, 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 sort of wealthy Silicon Valley class, uh, of which Mr. Musk, I think, uh, I suspect is a member, um, could, <laughs> could offer a different, an alternative answer, uh, an alternative answer to that question. As it happens, I just finished literally yesterday, I think we're done, um, co-chairing a National Academies look at this very question, and I guess my short answer, first of all, our principal finding was exactly the one Paul just talked about. We need a totally different way of governance, different mode of governance. Presidents have to quit changing the direction. Congress has to quit tinkering and micromanaging and so forth. They have to sustain this over time, which democracies aren't known for doing. Um, but, you know, while I hope Musk and a few other enthusiasts are right, after spending a year and a half with some of the some of the top technical people in the world, the short answer to the question is, in 15 or 20 years, you can go there and crash, you can fly by, or you, uh, but, but you won't go there and land and stay. Uh, based on anything we know now, there's some just gigantic, I'm sorry to say, daunting uh, uh, hurdles to be, to be uh, crossed. We, uh, we, we named uh, entry, descent, and landing. It's an unbelievably hard thing to imagine. Mm -hmm. uh, uh, in space propulsion, and radiation protection for the crew is the three biggest, so. Let's go, oh. Can I yeah, uh, sure. sort of follow, yeah. follow up on that, on that comment? So I, I also, I do wonder, right, whether the question is also with what, sort of what degree of reliability. Yeah. Right, because if, if you were to say, okay, you have a 70% chance of, of coming back. Right. Um, that might not be palatable <laughs> to NASA, for instance, right, but might be palatable to a, to a private sector. Uh, private well, very sector important. I, I confess to having been the one to press this point. We also said in the report that the nation, to embody, if you're serious about going to Mars, the nation has to accept that th there are risks, there will be setbacks, and there probably will be the loss of life. And, and our laws are not set up that way right now in, in reaction to the shuttle disasters. They're, there's, they're very, um, I'd, I'd say, uh, uh, defensive about that. So let's go over here. Hi. Uh, this is about Aura. So a lot of manufacturers, they'll eliminate like a battery cover and they'll take uh, like a micro SD card slot out just to, you know, make room for more technology in the phones. And, you know, with a modular design, you mentioned some like cool things that probably save some space, but just how do you compete with people that take like a clip out, you know, like a battery cover out just to save that space? Sorry, I'm not sure I fully understood the question. Okay, uh, well, so like with um, a lot of manufacturers like Apple, they take... Uh, like the back cover off, right? Just to, you know, more space as much as possible in that phone to fit electronics. Uh -huh. Whereas your design would be modular and there's plastic in between everything. How do you compete on the specs and everything? Oh, I see, I see. I understand the question. Yeah, so, uh, yeah, so I guess I should point out that we, we didn't invent modularity. There have, been, there have been a number of attempts at modular devices. Uh, there was a modular PDA. Uh, uh, some years back, uh, there was an Israeli company called Modu. Uh, that tried to make a modular phone a, f a few years in the sort of early uh, early 2000, early to mid 2000s. Um, so we we are by no means uh, original to the concept. I think we have an original industrial design. But um, uh, and and I think what led us to believe that we this could be the time is the trend towards miniaturization. Is in essence a corollary to Moore's law, right? That that the overhead associated with modularity gets smaller and smaller and smaller, um, and that includes both on the material side, the mechanical overhead. Uh, as well as the electrical overhead associated with all of the networking and signaling and the flexible power bus that has to go into the device. Um, but there is still overhead. There's no free lunch. Um, and our estimate, uh, just speaking in general terms, across sort of the size, meaning PCB area, uh, weight and power, assuming the outer, outer shape of the outer dimensions of the device are fixed, is about 25% overhead, is that we can get it down to that level. 
Uh, and, the 20, and so that means 25% less battery volume or 25% less circuit board area for, for functionality, uh, maybe 25% more mass, uh, perhaps. Uh, and, uh, and so our assessment, which, uh, again, it's very difficult to get consumer data to support this sort of thing, um, but our assessment is that at that, at that threshold, uh, it would be acceptable to consumers in exchange for the diversity of the kinds of things that you could get in, in the device and for the customization. Thank you. Over here. In terms of career choices, how did you go from West Lafayette to Google? <laughs> <laughs> um, so I actually ended up uh, at Google sort of accidentally. Uh, I, 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 as I mentioned, I, I went to DARPA and then I followed uh, uh, Regina to ATAP, uh, but ATAP was in Motorola. So I actually thought I was going to work for Motorola. Uh, Motorola was, of course, owned by Google uh, at the time. And then uh, just recently, just a few months ago, uh, I think February was the, the date of the announcement, uh, Google sold Motorola but kept the ATAP organization and moved it into core Google. So I'm a bit of an unwitting, uh, mm -hmm. unwitting Google employee. Um, that said, I do think that, that the Google sort of innovation culture is very consonant uh, with the kinds of, uh, the kinds of radical things uh, that we're trying to do. Over here. Uh, first of all, thank you for joining us here. It's been a pleasure hearing you speak. Um, you mentioned industrial design earlier, and as an industrial design student, that is very interesting to me. Um, and given we're at an engineering school, uh, do you think there's kind of be going to be a kind of a hybrid field between engineering and design in the near future, since the definition of design right now is kind of ambiguous? It's kind of stylistic, but at the same time, it's engineering. What kind of hybrid environments have you encountered at Google between engineering and design? So I, my, my personal view uh, is that the best engineers uh, are, and the best designers are polymaths, meaning that they can do a little <laughs> bit of everything, and they can synthesize these things, uh, these things in their head. I actually think that Mr. Jobs is an excellent example mm -hmm. of somebody who was able to do all of those things and envision a holistic product. Uh, both in terms of its functionality and in terms of its aesthetics. Um, and I think you have to have, uh, I think the really successful uh, folks in any discipline are, are those kinds of synthesizer, uh, interdisciplinary synthesizers. Um, I, uh, uh, I think that, uh, I, I don't know of any trend, uh, but I, I, I also don't know sort of the industrial design academic landscape that well uh, towards educating students that way. Um, and so that may be something that you have to do on your own in your copious spare time. <laughs> Thank you. Great, thanks. Uh, first, I'd like to congratulate you on your free trip home. <laughs> but, um, so I guess my question is, how do you balance the openness of the design of the phone with uh, the reliability of the product as a whole? Like, for instance, power supply uh, requirements for each module, things like that. Yeah, so uh, there are two, 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 two thresholds to that. Um, for basic safety, of modules, so making sure that a module doesn't melt, doesn't catch on fire, doesn't fry your brain, those kinds of things. Uh, uh, we will do that safety testing, or we will require module developers to self-certify um, to, kind of, uh, to that kind of safety testing before being admitted into the module marketplace. Um, in, terms of, uh, in terms of the module uh, uh, meeting performance specifications uh, or being nice to use, um, uh, the intent is to rely on user feedback in the very much the same way that the Play Store does with, I think, reasonable success, uh, rely on, on reviews and user ratings. Thanks. Um, thank you, Mr. Emanko, for being here. Um, my question was about m small and medium-sized industry manufacturing units uh, making these modules for, a as a business. What, do you, what kind of setup and capital investment would that sort of a business need? So we've tried to lower the capital investment to as close to zero as, as, as at all possible. Um, so, so whereas you could read the MDK, the module developers kit, and make everything from scratch based on the MDK. So from a philosophical perspective, I view that as the gold standard and has to be there as a, as a, as a sort of as a fallback position to keep us honest. Um, but as a practical matter, um, we are striving to make it so that you can buy all of the key components um, so the electropermanent magnets, there's a bunch of interface circuitry that's required in the module as a system and package, what's called a SIP, uh, that you should be able to buy those from DigiKey. 
um, and that there will be design templates, uh, reference designs uh, of a wide assortment of modules that we will put out there that you can basically take and steal, if you will, uh, and, and copy, copy at will. Um, and uh, we have been trying to get uh, contract manufacturers, so companies like Flextronics, uh, companies like Quanta, um, to also offer uh, for service, uh, fee for service, uh, but they're rel relatively inexpensive fee for service kind, uh, kinds of things to lay out a module. If you have a widget, say you have a new, new kind of sensor, and you are a savant at that kind of sensor, but you don't really care about everything else, um, you should be able to call them up and say, hey, lay out a module, uh, lay out a PCB and manufacture it around the sensor um, for a reasonably low investment. I, I can't quantify it yet for you. Um, but that's the goal. Um, and, and new tools. Um, so the tools are kind of an alpha bordering on beta right now. Uh, but that should also make it easier for you to, to do all of the verification on the module uh, on, a, on, a, on a desktop. Yes, sir. <clears throat> yes, uh, was this uh, design exercise done with the idea of uh, applying this uh, methodology to other devices like automobiles or you know, other technological things? Uh, and when you say this design exercise, you're referring to Project Ara? Yes. Um, so, so uh, there is sort of a natural tendency to, uh, to, to, to veer, especially because I think it's, it's in vogue towards Internet of Things kinds of applications, uh, and they are not lost on me. I, I do find them uh, a, a, a very high, high potential and, and, and extremely exciting. Um, I, I, I have had to focus the team. Um, so if we, I, uh, my belief is that if we try to be good at a wide assortment of things, we may end up being kind of mediocre at everything and not particularly good at anything, any one thing. So we have focused on the smartphone application sort of as a razor sharp, uh, razor sharp focus. We want to make a great smartphone. And it will probably be pretty good at other, other things. So you will probably be able to take a module out and uh, put it in your car, uh, put in your thermostat, uh, put in your television, and, and, and perhaps do other things. We are not explicitly designing for any of those applications um, because first and foremost, I want to make a great smartphone. And I think that's a compelling enough and a difficult enough application that it should yield a platform that's very robust to a wide assortment of other, other, other things. Thanks. Thanks. Um, <clears throat> how do you make Project R a popular so it like sells in like huge volumes? Because I worked as a cell phone salesman. It's very hard to sell people like something that's incredibly different and I know Project R, you want to have like modules made by third parties, so like to convince a Sony to build a camera, like it needs that volume. What are you guys going to do to make it popular so more than us are buying it? <laughs> <laughs> well, I'm glad you are all sold. Uh, so that uh, th that's a good start. Um, so what we have seen so far is uh, sort of a, a fairly remarkable outpouring of interest from uh, from consumers. Now, obviously, conversion from, uh, from interest and sentiment into sales is, uh, you know, it's not there till it's there. Um, uh, so we'll see. And that's one of the reasons we want to do the market pilot uh, before we commit to any sort of, uh, uh, any sort of global launch or, or, or going beyond that, is we want to see what it is about the product that appeals to people and what is the best way to market it to them. Because one of the things that, that, that you also probably appreciate having, uh, having the experience that you've had uh, is uh, the paradox of choice, is we, when people are presented with a large number of choices, they tend to seize up, and even if they're capable of navigating the choice space, they tend to have buyer's remorse because they're, they worry that they made the wrong choice. And this is replete with choices. Uh, uh, it'll probably have a higher dimensionality of the choice space or customiz the degrees of freedom of customization than any mass market product. Um, and so we have been thinking very carefully about how to help consumers try and navigate uh, navigate those decisions and curate them based on that particular consumer's appetite for choice, because not everybody has an equal, equal uh, uh, veracity for it. What I read about the sensor that's going to check my sweat and decide how much stress I'm under and then help me with the choices, didn't that, I? That that is one of the threads that we're pursuing is adaptive adaptive commerce experiences that actually non-invasively monitor uh, biometric signals about you. Um, so that includes galvanic skin response, uh, sweat levels, uh, your pupil dilation. Uh, gaze direction, uh, and a variety of other things that we can pick up non-invasively uh, about you as you're interacting with the e-commerce system. And if you're, if you're stressed or impatient or, uh, or bored with the experience, we could present a differently curated experience to you to cater more it's to It's in that category my daughters call too much information, I think. 
<laughs> you might, it's okay if you know, but I don't want to know. <laughs> Go ahead. Um, uh, well, <laughs> apps, uh, apps are, are very easily distributable, you know, since they're all code and, and, and stuff like that. But I was wondering whether you think that maybe uh, this with Project Ara, it will be possible someday to, to maybe get a, a good uh, distribution system that's going to be able to drive costs down and, and get assembly and all the, since this is physical, physical components and stuff, but like, Get it down to where it can be almost as streamlined as, as app, app, development, app development is now, where you develop once and then you can release it to the masses in, in like a big way. So, so the, the one thing I don't have a solution for is being able to download physical atoms yet, right? That would be cool. <laughs> and that may be a worthwhile uh, DARPA or ATAP project. Uh, but you still have to f ship, I mean, a uh, pu pushing, pushing photons and electrons is still different than moving atoms around. So I, I don't have a magic solution to getting module, I mean, aside from a nice logistics and distribution system, uh, which we fully intend to build for the market pilot, uh, I, I, don't, I don't know of a way of getting modules to you faster. Um, I think DHL, FedEx, and UPS have pretty much opti <laughs> optimized the hell out of that problem. <laughs> Go ahead. All right, Mr. Armoco, my question is about the endoskeletons, actually. Um, so how did you, I know you have, you mentioned you had three sizes. How did you decide upon those particular sizes and are there, is there room for expansion in the future? Yeah, so you, you want the honest answer? <laughs> so the, the medium variant, uh, uh, we sized based on anthropometric data about, uh, about the human hand and uh, the human pocket. And it's about the size of a Moto X uh, or a variety of other sort of no normal size, normal, non-jumbo size uh, cell phones. Um, uh, uh, and so that's kind of the, the nominal, uh, the nominal variant. Uh, and then the, the mini is one third narrower and the jumbo is one third wider because of the partitioning scheme, basically. Um, now it so happens that, uh, so everybody tells me, by the way, so we're probably going to take two of those sizes and I'm not sure which two, uh, to the market pilot. Uh, and everybody tells me, oh, the industry's trend is towards gi these ginormous devices. And, and in fact, if you, if you travel to Asia, people walk around with tablet, talking on tablets which I think is kind of, uh, <laughs> kind of an odd fashion trend. Uh, and so, so, so everybody uh, is, is, the conventional wisdom is at least pushing us towards the larger device. Uh, either me being contrarian or, or wishful thinking, I don't know. I have a particular affinity for the mini. Um, uh, I'm not, it's not really clear to me why cell phones are getting bigger. Because <laughs> um, to me, sort of Moore's Law and all the other things should make things smaller. And I understand that too small is, you know, there is a too small uh, for, for, for hand comfort. But the mini variant, if you, w when you hold it in your hand, is just really, really compelling. It's just, it's a very sexy, I think, form factor. Um, and so, so I'm actually inclined to, to go orthogonally to the rest of the industry and try that. But who knows? All right, thank you. What markets are for? Um, right. Yep, um, thanks for the talk. And my question is, what is the, what is the how to solve the compatibility issue in between the hardware and software? Do you have a plan for the solving the, that issue? Um, so I'm not sure exactly which compatibility issue you're um, referring to. Such as to. if there is a variety of different hardwares, then an operating system or the other software, you need to allow some corner mode or I some see. development. Yes. Yeah, so, so, uh, so we are using Android mm -hmm. uh, on the device, which should come as no surprise. Uh, and we do have to make some changes to Android in order to be able to support this, this kind of ecosystem. One major change that we're making is at the Linux kernel level, so Android runs on top of the Linux kernel, um, is we're implementing a set of device class drivers. So rather than having, for each camera, having a unique device driver for that camera, which is the state of the world today, um, we will have a camera class uh, and the device will need to conform to the camera class specification. And then if it has unique functionality, you know, say it's a hyperspectral camera or something like that, um, that functionality has to be pushed to user space um, so that it doesn't run at kernel level. Um, and then that's a security, uh, security scaling issue. If you now have thousands of modules and each one has its unique device driver, you can't link them all into the kernel and have them run it at sort of the highest level of privilege. Please. Uh, hello. Uh, regarding this innovation, there's kind of a dilemma for the PhD students, especially because after spend like four years or five years studying one spe uh, specific area, it's kind of surrounded by a barrier around him for long and probably you cannot jump through it. So I would ask, if, do you have any suggestion for this kind of PhD student? And another one is that when you like, when you are meeting graduation, so you want to go to the job market. 
You want to convince the employee, employers saying that you can apply your knowledge in this field to other fields. So, but they always think that you, always, you already studied like a long time in this field. Probably your knowledge is only in this <laughs> small area. So how can you broaden your horizon like you jump from this spaceship to this smartphone? <laughs> so, <laughs> that is a, uh, those are provocative questions. And at the, at the risk of having uh, fruits and vegetables thrown at me from the audience, uh, I will say that I, I, I do think that there is a lot of opportunity for academia to work much more closely with industry. And I think that's a missed opportunity. And actually, the same is true as between academia and government. Um, I think DARPA was accused for, for many years for becoming kind of insular uh, and, uh, and uh, uh, scaring away academics by, uh, say, publication review and, and other kinds of things. Uh, and and uh, while I was at DARPA uh, under, under Regina's leadership, uh, we tried to do away with a lot of that and become much more academic friendly because we do think that academic research uh, when crossed with a compelling use case, as DARPA is prone to offer, uh, yields higher quality research and frankly yields better career opportunities for the students. Um, we've done similarly at ATAP. Um, and so we have created something called the MURA, the Multi-University Research Agreement, um, which allows us to contract with uh, universities who subscribe to the agreement, uh, who agree to the agreement. And I think we have 15 or 16 universities now. Purdue is one of, one of the schools. Um, uh, and, and allow us to contract with those universities very, very quickly. Um, so all of the intellectual property terms and all of the things that are usually sticking points and that usually take up to maybe six months to negotiate uh, in a traditional corporate, corporate university agreement uh, can now be done in a matter of days. They're all pre-negotiated, so there's basically a template. Um, and, so, uh, and so we've demonstrated being able to uh, get university research uh, on contract in support of a particular project, including Project ARA, uh, within a matter of days. Um, and I think that's, that's remarkable, and I think that's good for both of us, right? So it lets us tap talent such as, you, such as yourselves, but it also gives you a compelling use cases uh, in the context of which to conduct your research and to help drive your research. And I think it ends up being higher quality research. So I think my, my meta answer maybe to your, uh, to your mm -hmm. very specific question uh, is, that, is that by bringing, uh, bringing corporate research and academic research closer together, I think will benef ultimately benefit both. Thank I told you. Paul backstage that when I, I heard that pitch from one of his colleagues, this is about 16 months ago, partly for demonstration purposes, I insisted that we send the, our letter, our MURA, back in one day. That's right. Just to, just to let them know we, we that's had, right. and that's we, the master we, we had Purdue get it. That was the master We, we get it, yeah, about yeah. That's right. Right. That's right. I want to thank everybody for the uh, brevity of the questions. If we're going to get through what we have in our appointed time, we're going to need to continue that. So please, over here, and, and just uh, as concisely as you can. Okay. Um, I was wondering your points of views on Project R being used in the maker space. Um, how, um, the, how friendly you want to be to hackers using the guts and the body to do things, and how much you think there's a potential for that. Yeah, we are extraordinarily friendly um, uh, to that. Uh, you can do whatever you want with it, right? It's a, it's a completely open, it's an open design. Uh, we make developer hardware available um, to folks, and uh, we've had a lot of interest from, uh, uh, from the maker community. Um, I do think that ARA is an opportunity to actually convert sort of hobbyist level projects into something that you can ultimately monetize and turn into a career if it's a really good idea. Um, which is not an avenue that easily exists today um, for makers, uh, makers and DIY enthusiasts. Great. Yep. Uh, yes, my question, uh, so the modules are to, uh, intended to be very open and anyone can create one, but uh, on the other side, the base hardware, is that something that's intended to, you have these two options, and obviously I mean, there may be more in the future, but is it something like uh, maybe Samsung makes a new smartphone and has a module slot in it because you can change out your camera or something like that. Is, is, is the base hardware something that is, can't, will be able to be made by other uh, third parties? So for the foreseeable future, our intent is to fairly tightly control the endos. Um, and that's actually not, a, uh, that's not meant to be a money-making money kind of thing. Uh, it's a fairly low-value item. It's just a, it's a frame and a network switch. Uh, the, the reason for that is uh, until the ecosystem grows up, both on the developer side and on the consumer side, we're very, very worried about fragmentation or perturbations to the, uh, to the platform specification itself. 
Um, so I, I wouldn't rule out uh, licensing uh, the endo potentially uh, to, to third parties in the long run. Um, but in the immediate future, uh, by which I mean for the duration of the development program and for the market pilot, uh, so probably through 2015, um, I think we're going to keep, uh, keep fairly tight control uh, to ensure consistency across the endos. Hi. Um, I have a question similarly about the, the base system. Um, where would you put your project on a scale from, let's say, like a, a wall phone where you don't really have any control, it's non-modular, to a box of cert, like, that was a bad way, like, <laughs> how, how modular can you go? Because you can say, we can replace the memory, we can replace the storage, we can replace the battery, but will, are you willing to go down to, we can replace the CPU, we can replace yeah, so the PCBs? That's right, so, so the frame itself is, is a dumb device. It doesn't do anything by itself. So the CPU is one of the modules. Um, so everything is a module. Uh, and the partitioning of functionality across modules is for the developer ecosystem to sort out. Um, so some things probably are naturally bundled together uh, some things should be separated because consumers want to sw swap those things out more frequently. Um, and we don't have a strong position on that. I mean, we put out some reference designs, but they're non-prescriptive uh, non in nature. Thank you. Hello, Paul. My name is Sergey. I have one question. I heard that are using uh, 3D printing for producing some parts. Uh, why are you choose that way? Because I heard that very expensive and slow way. Please comment that. So we did, in fact, uh, look at making the shells um, using 3D printed materials. That offers sort of an extra degree of customization in that allows you to alter the texture, uh, creates sort of two and a half dimensional structures, uh, and, and sort of an interesting, interesting new direction uh, for digital artists and consumers alike to, uh, to customize. Um, as it turned out, the, there is a little ways to go in the 3D, <laughs> in the 3D printing space. Um, so for, uh, for now, uh, we're using polycarbonate with dye sublimation uh, uh, as the, as the aesthetic, aesthetic elements of the device. I do think the 3D printing offers some really exciting prospects, and I think that cost in the long run will, will uh, diminish uh, as, as it gets to maturity and scale. Um, it's, that strikes me as, as an industrial-based uh, industrial domain that will follow something very close to Moore's Law in terms of the, in terms of the pace of advances. So I'm not too concerned about the long-term costs of 3D printing, and the capabilities are, are pretty staggering, right? So one of the things that you could, we, we uh, have looked at doing is embedding the antenna in the shell and creating the, the antenna custom uh, from mm -hmm. shell to shell uh, using condu a conductive ink layer. So you just have another inkjet head uh, that deposits conductive ink uh, as opposed to the acrylate ink that's used to make the plastic. So it is a, it is a very exciting technology, and one day, um, uh, I think it'd be pretty cool if you could if you could have a machine. It's probably a combination of additive, uh, so 3D printing and subtractive, like milling and machining processes, and some pick and place. But it would be pretty <laughs> cool if you could have a machine that you you say, here's the phone I want, here are the features I want. Uh, it doesn't have to be modular, and it just makes the phone. Uh, and I do think that day will come. We've got five would-be questioners, and actually fewer than five minutes, but we can take five. So let's keep let's keep moving and briskly, please. Hi, I was wondering about the process that like a DARPA or the ATAP uses uh, to go fishing for innovative ideas and then choose which ones to pursue further. Um, so we, uh, at, the, at the executive level, and this is true both at DARPA and, uh, uh, and at ATAP, is uh, there has to be some overarching vision, right? So what are our technology areas uh, that we're interested in getting into or technology areas that we're not interested in getting into? And that does require some some higher level thinking about the strategic landscape. Um, and that's done by the leadership. So at ATAP it's done by Regina, at DARPA it was done by the agency director and the office directors. Um, and, uh, and then w once we identify a domain, so in the case of, for instance, me being recruited into ATAP, um, uh, Regina was interested in the domain of advanced manufacturing and customization. Um, and, uh, she, uh, and so the, uh, you identify it at that sort of level of resolution, and you say, that sounds like an interesting area. Uh, there may be some new possible, exciting new technologies emerging, right? So, so let's see if that opens up new product possibilities, and let's find the best person in the world uh, in, that particular, in that particular area, and let's bring them in as a, as a, to formulate a project and, and run the project. Um, and so that's kind of the recruitment model, both at DARPA and, uh, and at ATAP, is you identify broad areas of interest, 
and then you try to find the best talent uh, that, you, that you can anywhere and convince them to come in and explore those areas. Great, thank you. Over here. How you doing? Um, you pretty much answered most of my questions as soon as I walked up, but I refused to walk away. Make up another, <laughs> make up another one. <laughs> um, uh, my comments, my questions are regarding the security and privacy of the device, um, especially since uh, the device is very modular and we're heading towards uh, this concept of Internet of Things where um, all of our devices are interconnected. interconnected. How do you ensure, well, one, how do you ensure security and privacy of the user? How do you, um, how does the modularity of the de uh, components affect the security, I mean, the security, security model of the operating system architecture? Uh, and how does, um, and how does each component um, affect another component's uh, security, yeah. especially in terms of communicating with each other? So these are all very fair and, and very apropos questions. Um, and I wish I had sort of a pithy catch-all answer mm -hmm. to them, uh, and I don't. So as, as any new innovation expands the, uh, uh, and changes, I should say, not necessarily expands the attack surface uh, from a security perspective, um, uh, but good ones also introduce new opportunities to improve security and manage security. Um, and so in this case, yes, you now have a network on device and that uh, all of the different uh, attack vectors associated with the network architecture are now present on the device. And, and uh, so the, uh, the same kinds of tools that we use to safeguard uh, Ethernet type network and Wi-Fi type networks, um, we now have to miniaturize and, and, and in place uh, in the device. We have to apply appropriate encryption standards uh, and things like that. I should say though that, that the, our architecture does offer some interesting new opportunities for uh, for privacy uh, and security. One example is uh, those, those little one-by-one -one modules that you have. Um, I'd, I'd, I think it'd be really cool. Uh, and mind you, Google doesn't make, it's not in the module business, so this is just an idea for somebody else to go make. Um, hopefully there's, there's some entrepreneurs in the audience. Uh, is an identity module uh, that stores all of my sort of roots of trust, all of my certificates, all of my private data, for instance, that's on the phone, and I take it out and the phone is completely anonymized. Uh, and I can hand the phone to some, to Mitch, and uh, and he would put in his own identity module, and it becomes his phone completely, uh, uh, and everything about it becomes his phone. And then I carry that on my keychain, and hopefully don't lose my keychain, right? So there's another. <laughs> so so that's an opportunity, right? But creates another set of vulnerabilities that you have to uh, you have to figure out. Um, so there's no. I don't have a magic answer for you, but c th these are clearly very serious concerns, and uh, and we have to address them before we put this in consumer hands. Okay. Great question. Thank, Thank you. you. Hi, Paul. Uh, <coughs> so this is a more general question on innovation. Um, so you mentioned a couple of times that we've been, as a society, pushing against the limits of complexity that we can deal with. Do you think there is, a, there is like an ultimate limit before the system becomes too complex for humans to innovate? Um, so I don't, I don't think that there is. Um, and I think that there are many examples of us introducing better tools, smarter architectures. Um, so I don't think that the only answer to complexity is make things simpler. Um, I think that there are, uh, there are more sophisticated answers. I think integrated circuit design is one example uh, of where we have been able to sustain some seven orders of magnitude growth in, in complexity, as in that case measured by transistor count, uh, uh, without compromising product development timelines or product quality. And in fact, product development timelines have gone down, if anything, uh, slightly. Um, and the way that's been done is through modularization of the product, which makes it a little bit less optimal, which as uh, we discussed, uh, and through tools that allow you to design at a higher level of abstraction. Um, so designers no longer, as, as was the case in the, in the 70s and early 80s, uh, when you made an integrated circuit, and uh, if you find a photograph uh, of the 8008 uh, or the 8080 from Intel, uh, early 80s kind of processors, 70s, 80s uh, type processors, you can see them, it's a jumble of wires, right? And it was very clear that a human uh, did all the routing and placement of transistors on those chips. And as you move past the, the Intel 386, and I'm just using Intel as the sort of uh, the common timeline here, um, this is true across the, the integrated circuit uh, industrial base, uh, you can, you, just looking at the chip, looking at a, at a microscope uh, photograph of the chip, you can see that it's clearly machine generated. Um, and, and so today, uh, in order to design an integrated circuit, you describe the logic functionality in a fairly high level language, like RTL is, is one example, and then you get the physical system. And the physical system is less optimal, both because of modularity and because it's auto-designed auto and, and follows certain rules and patterns in order to simplify it. 
so you sacrifice optimality in exchange for uh, complexity and, and keeping time and keeping the verifiability of the system. And I think that's possible across a broader range of cyber electromechanical systems. Um, I just think that the, uh, I think w one of the things is we tend to reward uh, in, in uh, particularly in the corporate world, we tend to reward engineers uh, for the what, but not so much for the how. Uh, and many fewer minds are thinking about the how, the tools and the manufacturing processes. Uh, the sexy stuff is this shiny new airplane and nobody <laughs> cares about how that airplane was designed. <laughs> Uh, but really a lot of unlocking a lot of the innovation it may, might be in looking at new ways of doing the how. So I don't think there's an inherent limit to complexity. I do think that adding brains, uh, using the same tools and just adding brains and growing the team or growing the company, growing the organization, is not a way to tackle complexity. Because humans are not compos composably additive in that sense. We have a very low bandwidth comms link between us. Uh, and so, uh, so doing parallel processing between our two brains is not an efficient way to divvy up uh, the problem. We need a new way. Hi, Paul. So I'm a father of two boys in the West Side school system, so you're a great inspiration to me. Um, <laughs> Thank you. I wonder if you can share with uh, the parents out here and the students how hard you've worked and your approach to education. My approach to education? Yeah. Um, gosh. Uh, so... Uh, so I think, uh, actually I think, I think I have a very simple answer to your question, which is um, you just have to find something that you or, or the, the, the object of your educational efforts uh, is passionate about, uh, and something that it's, excites you and inspires you, and then it ceases to become hard work, and it becomes fun. Um, and I have been extremely lucky, uh, and I'm grateful, uh, you know, to the West Side School System and to uh, and to Purdue and 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 uh, and the other uh, uh, entities that have enabled people and entities that have enabled this for me. But I have been extremely lucky that every single job I have had has been the most fun I've had up to that at that point in my life. Uh, and I, I I hope that progression can continue. <laughs> but it and it so I don't even think of it as work. I think of it as fun. And so ha uh, having hard fun. Uh, doesn't sound nearly as bad as doing hard work, does it? Great. Thank you. Last word. So, other than smartphones, what, what other areas does ATAP work on? And second, um, do you hire interns? <laughs> <laughs> Excellent. Um, those are appropriate notes to close on. Um, uh, so, uh, ATAP is still growing. Uh, there is a number of different projects, uh, not all of which are public. Uh, the public ones uh, that you can, uh, you can read about are um, a Tango is a sister project of ours. Uh, it's an augmented reality system. It's a sensor suite that goes into tablets and, and into smartphones that allows you to not just take visual uh, images and video of the world around you, but three-dimensional mapping. So you get a depth map. Uh, and so that allows you to do all sorts of fun augmented reality things from gaming to trying to uh, potentially create a map of all indoor spaces in the world, right? So imagine Google Maps, but, but indoors everywhere uh, also. Um, and so, so that's, that's pretty exciting. It's led by a, a very talented, uh, a talented researcher, uh, originally from CMU, who also worked on the Microsoft Connect system. His name is Johnny Lee. Um, another one that's completely different uh, is called Spotlight Stories. Uh, and Spotlight Stories is about using your phone as a new storytelling canvas. Um, and uh, we've, ha we've been very lucky to have some very famous uh, uh, animators, director, producers, uh, Glenn Keane most recently, who was the creator of The Little Mermaid and a variety of other iconic, uh, iconic <laughs> Disney, uh, Disney mm -hmm. films, uh, uh, get excited about uh, uh, creating stories for this new medium. And the, the, the reason it's a new medium is because you can control the direction of the camera. You have gyros and accelerometers in your device, and so the phone can act as a window uh, into the, the animator's world, as opposed to the animator fixing your point of view and, and sort of rendering all the scenes uh, in advance and saying this is exactly what you'll see. You can explore the story, and the story can be nonlinear and can evolve with uh, what, it, what it is that you're interested in. And so, uh, so you, can, uh, you can follow different characters, and the story can, can fork uh, and, then, and then hopefully converge in the end uh, to make it a good story. Uh, so, th and there are a couple of episodes of Spotlight Stories, I think right now is only for the Moto X, um, uh, but, uh, uh, but there are a couple of different uh, episodes for it, um, and, and they're pretty interesting, so I, enc I encourage you to, to have a look at it. It is, it is a different experience, it is a fundamentally different and, and really delightful experience. 
Um, and uh, we don't participate in the Google internship program. So if you, if you want the experience from the movie The Internship, you should apply to the, to the big Google internship program. Um, uh, the, uh, we do, however, hire uh, people for the summer and people in a variety of other, uh, of other capacities. Uh, flexibility in the way we access talent is one of, our, one of the staples of the operating model. Um, and so if you're interested, it's my last name at google.com. Thank you. I want to thank everyone for coming. I want to, in particular, the questioners for a great set of, uh, of questions. Uh, I'll just venture to say that this is exactly the sort of evening we had in mind in starting this series. And uh, we have a very diverse and, I think, terrific lineup coming. But ours also is an open process. And I would very much welcome suggestions about other uh, figures you would like to, to see. I've yet to approach anybody from any realm who wasn't interested in coming to Purdue. Right. Even those who didn't grow up in West Lafayette. <laughs> uh, but I'll, I will also venture to say that no matter um, uh, who comes uh, uh, to this series in the future, we're not going to have a night any more interesting than the one we just enjoyed. Paul, thank you very, very much. And we're proud to be indirectly associated. It's, it's terrific.